I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I just thought I'd give a little bit of background and maybe play a little clip from an interview I think we did, Jonathan, over a year ago now, um, where we were talking about the initial Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris debate. And you made a really fascinating point about the phenomenology of consciousness. And I, I think I talked to Jordan about it very soon afterwards. And we, like the, the seed was sown back then about maybe having a dialogue around this, this wider topic of consciousness and maybe the place that Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris got stuck that could be the place that's most fruitful to explore. So I'll just play that quick clip now. If I had a discussion with Sam Harris, I would just say, okay, look, I know you don't like religion. I'm religious, that's fine. Let's not talk about that because it's gonna be a dead end. Let's talk about consciousness. Let's talk about that and let's lay it out, okay? What does a world in which consciousness is central, how does it lay itself out? How does attention lay itself out, right? It lays itself out in terms of hierarchies terms of hierarchies you have a point of attention and then around that point lay the world kind of flows out into chaos which is on the edge even in your visual uh frame that's how it works right so you have points of attention and then on the edges you have this chaotic space which is which is kind of gray and and, and not totally there and so you say okay so now let's take that experience of consciousness and let's say that that's the foundation of reality that's what he says he says that's the foundation of reality well is there an analog to that in a community what does that look like? What does, a commu what does the analog of consciousness in a community look like? It looks like? it looks like gathering together around a point, looks like turning around a point. It, it's, it's circumambulation, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a hierarchy of social, of, of structure. Uh, and it ends up looking like a religious ritual. That's what it looks like, right? Because that's, that's r religious rituals are, have the same structure as the structure of consciousness. So I think that that's, and then how does, what does that look like in time? What does the experience of consciousness look like if you see it with the frame of time? And what it looks like is a story. Do you guys feel that, like that, that point, the phenomenology of consciousness, like what the consciousness looks like a story, is that the place that could unstick this conversation? Or how do you want to take the... Well, I mean, not to be instantaneously hyper meta, but... The very first thing that happens is the fact that we're even conscious of the fact that we're talking about epistemology as a thing. Um, I think that's already a piece of unsticking the conversation is actually having awareness of the underlying basis that gives rise to the constructs that we happen to be operating in um, and just being willing to go down that stack as far as we need to go. So, um, so that we don't, don't get stuck on things that at least now in the, in the contemporary world, we at least have in principle the capacity to have, some facility with mm -hmm. um so that was my the thing that got that, that i actually felt stuck like almost like choking on a bone when listening to that conversation uh between uh, jordan and sam was the fact of kind of an epistemological just zooming past each other right and the inability to look at it and say oh wait a minute we're actually instantiating orthogonal epistemologies um and there's no there's no basis to actually establish one as being the dominant epistemology. Yeah. Um, so that's it. We're sort of done. There's no, not all, but we can see like, what do you do in that context? That's kind of an interesting conversation. What do you do when you're in that situation um, and exploring it? But it felt like there, there wasn't actually an ability to kind of step one level higher or deeper, depending on your preferred metaphor and have that conversation. One of the things that in terms of Sam Harris, if we're going to start with that conversation that I find fascinating is that, to a certain extent, Jordan Peterson talks about consciousness, talks about the phenomenology of consciousness quite a bit. And Sam talks about it as well in terms of, in terms of the basis of the world. That is, he, he really has this meditative practice. He has this connection to Eastern practices. And so he has had mystical, it seems, at least that's what he said. He's, he seems to say that he has had some mystical experiences where he's experienced his, the bareness of his consciousness as this point, kind of this point of origin out of which the world kind of lays itself out or, or comes, comes towards, you could say. Um, and so what fascinates me is that he has that experience, he has that understanding, let's say, of, of the, the, basic of, the basis of all our experience of being this first person uh, looking around and experiencing the world, but he then jumps from that point to science. 
And so he, he says, here's the basis of existence. That is, this is the only thing almost that we can say is real. And then he goes from there to this analytic mode, which is, a, which is actually an alienated mode where you have to make the effort of alienating yourself from your first person perspective and looking at the world in this flat way. Whereas if to me, what I find strange is that he, if he was able to understand how taking that point of consciousness as the origin if you follow the steps and then you understand that these consciousnesses, let's say, come together and stack up, and that's how you build families, that's how you build larger units or, you know, that you build these distributed consciousnesses, whatever you want to call it, you know, cities, countries, uh, identities that are larger than a person, and that the way that within yourself you function, the way that you have parts and that those parts interact is the same as how that happens at a higher scale and that that's the same thing that happens in a story that's how we create images all of these human uh all of the bases of human culture and, and human wisdom is there and religion is part of it so if you look at religious practice you would see that procession processing having sacred spaces where everybody gathers together and acts in the same manner uh speaks the same words or uh sometimes it can be a rhythm in that speaking, there can be a back and forth between two sides and there can be a processing. Uh, all of these actions make a lot more sense if you understand them through the phenomenology of consciousness. But if you then jump to an analytic mode where you analyze everything flat in terms of its atoms and its molecules and everything, then you look at the, the phenomena of religion and you think it's, it's idiotic because it doesn't, fit, it, it doesn't fit that way. It fits through the... the through that other side. So I don't understand how he's not able to, it's like there's a weird blindness in his, mm. in his approach to reality where he jumps from one to the other and he doesn't, he's not able to make the, he's not able to draw the line in order to, to get there. I, I don't understand. Well, I'd love to interject here before you start, Jordan, just because I'm, what I'm hearing when Jonathan says that and I'd not thought about this before is coherence. Like what he's talking about, like speaking the same words in a ritual together is, feels like, co like coherence being primary in terms of consciousness and then a shared experience of consciousness being somehow primary. Which just, I'm, I'm just throwing that in because that relates to something we've been talking about quite a bit recently. I, I, get, the, I get the feeling like that would be, an, like to bring that up later. I feel like that actually, like sure. seating it now, seating it now is great and it can percolate. But I think cool. there's actually gonna be a moment, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, watch, you ready? 37 <laughs> minutes from now, where it'll actually be just right. <laughs> 37 minutes from now. Okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So the thing that, that, that I was noticing that was actually kind of piquing my curiosity and felt um, like maybe most helpful or most useful is actually just an inquiry into, into that, the, that notion of how is that happening? Because yeah. it's, it, it raises the question, the, ba the general question of how does, how does the, the, the mode or the, the, the way that a given mind, and by the way, I'm making a distinction here, mind, uh, the way a given mind um, grasps or approaches uh, the, the, the questions that, that arise for it. Um, so in this case, we're, we're talking about Sam Harris, or at least the particular caricature of Sam Harris that we're playing with, the sandbox Sam Harris that, we're, that we'll now be poking at, as having this interesting, um, certainly from our perspective, and, and by the way, I share this perspective, um, uh, odd characteristic of starting at first person but then as soon as thinking begins, it immediately flips to an obligate third person mm. perspective. And I remember yeah. specifically obligate third person, which is to say without a conscious choice, like it's, a, it's an unconscious, almost like a structural characteristic that forces the entire awareness capacity, the ability to perceive what is real into that obligate point of view, um, such that it, it, even because of that, the ability to actually be aware of or notice the the curiousness, the almost, um, the feeling, I have a feeling of like uh, the disorienting feeling of moving from first person to third person without any step in between. <laughs> um, so there's a bunch of stuff there, right? There's a bunch, the notion of like the distinction between consciousness and mind, the notion of, of what mind is and how it actually emerges, how one might go about having this notion of having an obligate perspective and how that would happen and why it might happen. Um, and even possibly thinking about it in terms of given where we are now, like who we are as humans in the world, 
the cultures that we're in and the things that we're facing, is there a way for us to actually be conscious of how we design mind so that the mind that we are using to apprehend world is uh, most suitable to the world that we find ourselves in? Hmm. When you say design mind, I'm not sure what you mean. You mean by design your own mind or design people's mind or design an artificial intelligence? What do you mean by design mind? Well, interestingly, I did not think about the third, but that definitely comes up, doesn't it? Um, I was initially thinking about the first. And then as you were you know, bringing me to, into more um, inquiry, the question of parenting becomes almost immediate. So um, one might assume that most minds are developmental. They, they are developed in the process of the, the coming into be, becoming of a person. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether we're being intentional about it or not, we are contributing meaningfully to the mind that a given child that we happen to be parenting has. Yeah. So I feel like the first and, t first and second feel very nice to me. The third, frankly, is a little bit scary for me and I'm, I kind of want to step back from it. Uh, well, in terms, of a, in terms of a child, I think that the, the uh, how can I say this? The best way to train a mind, I would say, is love. It, it's, I, sorry to use that word that, that everybody <laughs> find, but uh, the, the idea of this is this is related to what I'm talking about in terms of the notion that consciousness uh, stacks up or that person stacked come together in terms of communion. And so the the idea of that communion is the way to train a mind that mm. being in a relationship with someone, that's the real way to train a mind that by attending, <laughs> you know, by paying attention to something by, uh, you know, treating them, treating something, treating a child is important. And, and when you do that, then you have two sides, which will appear right away. One is uh, a side, which is to encourage what is, what is, what encourages the communion. And then the other would be to discourage, you know, a right and a left hand, a right hand to bring closer and a left hand to move away. And that actually is training the mind in how to, um, how to interact with the world. That is when we interact with the world, we have those same two tendencies, which is the, the tendency towards one and the tendency towards many, you know, the perceiving the, the, the one and perceiving the many, when you're raising up a child, that's what you're constantly doing in terms of the child. You're, you're, you're constantly showing the child what is, what is straight and what is crooked, you could say. And the child will have to explore what is crooked as well. They'll have to, you know, it's part of, of doing it, but then they'll also see the consequences of the crooked and the consequences of the straight, all this. And so to me, that's how you, that's how you, you train a mind. It, and it comes back to this idea that the, the, rea the first reality of human people is, is people. Like we, 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 the first thing we care about is other minds, other people. That's what we care about first. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, there's a couple of things that come up. I mean, uh, what I would say is that part of my, um, my preferred way to be in dialogue is to make sense together. So mm -hmm. to the degree to which there's a material for sense making in front of us, I feel called to step in, like step in with my, I guess you're a sculptor, right? Well, for whatever reason, I had a metalworking metaphor come to me. So I've got a hammer banging on the, on the metal. I apologize if those two don't go to weather together well. <laughs> um, what kind of popped in my head was this really nice uh, um, play on words, which is uh, attending rather than pretending. Um, because what I've noticed is that many parents, um, and I have meaningful experience in this, um, pretend to attend. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really problematic. And this, I think, is a characteristic of a particular kind of mind. So we now have an interesting feedback loop, which is that first question. How do you actually shift your own mind so that a habit of pretending is actually able to be replaced by an actual lived attending, which then yeah. gives rise to the possibility of then that relationship with your child that we've identified as perhaps being the way to um, help them develop their mind. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think that's when you know practices like uh, practicing attention itself the, in in the in the Christian mystical uh, tradition you have this idea that there's attention and then there's memory. You always have to remember remember yourself. Uh, the idea is remembering God and remembering death. You could say remembering the two extremes. And when you do that, then you it's diff, it's you don't get distracted. You're, well, we end up, it happens anyways, but it's like, if you're capable of keeping attention and keeping memory in the sense of remembering 
not remembering the things in the past, but re remembering the sense of staying connected to staying connected to something. Remembering. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you you're you're in this state of attention and memory, and then you it's more difficult. What it's then you won't pretend, or if you do, um, uh huh. Yeah. It'll be malicious if you do. It won't be like it won't. It'll be even worse if you if you if you pretend when you're attending because it'll almost be immoral because you'll you'll be doing it out of uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I would say it'd be, be, be profane. Yeah, because when if you well, usually we're distracted. That's why we pretend. That's why we don't attend to our children because it's like we're there with our children, but we're thinking about our job. We're thinking about whatever other problem, some stupid thing someone said on Facebook or whatever. And then, you know, we're not there. Um, and, and I think, but I do think that being there, like giving a child attention for like 10 minutes, like actual real attention. I mean, you can feed a child, that child, like actual real attention, I've noticed that if I can do that with my kids for like 10 minutes a day, they're happy. Then after that, it's like everything kind of is together. But if I can just like focus for 10 minutes, then real, real attention, uh, then they know that, that you care and they know that they're part of this family. Well, here I flag um, violating my own principle of uh, <laughs> coherence. Um, there's something there. So just to kind of make the, the ding or the sound of the tone in the, in the, uh, in the ether. Um, what was something that there's a few things. Oh, I, I was just reading with my wife, um, rereading Dan Siegel's book on uh, the whole brain child. One of our, we have a, a 11 month old, 11 and a half. Oh yeah. Okay. And one of the commitments that we've made, we actually went through a program called uh, parenting a spiritual practice, uh, twice, <laughs> um, that's produced by some, uh, some Canadians. And one of the things that came out of that was an introduction to Dan Siegel's work. And he's now made a commitment to reread that periodically just to kind of keep the, his good heuristics. I don't know if you know his work, but no. they're very good concrete. Like here's ways to deal with um, being in relationship with the child's mind. And one of the mm -hmm. distinctions he makes is between implicit and explicit memory. And um, I think that was a, there was an interesting, it's not a, it's not a mapping. I'm not actually implying that the thing that you were saying uh, between a, a kind of remembering is like remembering things that are in the past and a kind of remembering that was a coming together. But there's a, an interesting connection, like a, 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 um, like a, a tonal resonance between implicit and explicit. So uh, explicit memory is what you were talking about in terms of remembering things in the past. So remember a few minutes ago when David said that thing, that's yeah. explicit memory. And it's interesting to even feel what it feels like to be in that mode of explicit memory. It's like that, you know, the theater yeah. of the mind metaphor implicit memory is the thing like you know how do you ride a bike you know, there's yeah. a process where you learned how to ride a bike and you built it into your body you mm. embodied the capacity to ride a bike and i think there's something very consonant between that that to to embody the capacity to live in continuity with life mm. is i think very close to what you're talking about so yeah to the degree to which you have been healthy you've actually become whole in yourself so there's nothing in you that's between you and and the life that you're in relationship with, then to be remembered would be to bring yourself back, to bring your implicit memory, yeah. um, to tune your implicit memory so that your implicit memory makes it now possible for you to be present to the moment fully. Yeah, and it's I think easy. that in terms, of, in terms of kids, you can see, I can see it because we did, we homeschooled our kids. Um, and now my daughter, she, she decided to go to school. She's 12. And uh, we were really nervous at first because obviously homeschool is different, you know, just the whole approach and it's more holistic. It's more about people and relationships, you know, um, and giving the, giving the kid time to be really bored, uh, mm. you know, so that they thinking about stuff and that, you know, my son picked up the piano just cause he was so bored and he just started playing three hours a day and we're like, yeah, you know, it works. But <laughs> it, we were a little afraid of the academic part because, you know, we didn't ha hammer on that as much. And so our daughter went to school and she did totally fine. Like she's completely fine. You know, she has, she has, she has good grades. She, she's doing well. And what I realize is it has something to do with what you were talking about in terms of, I think that what we gave her in homeschool was not so much a bunch of stuff to learn, but rather a way of being and a way of learning that that's, so that's the implicit part. It's like, she knows how to learn. She knows how to be. And so put her in any circumstance she'll be fine. Like she, she, she might not, even if she doesn't know something, she knows how to 
to be quiet and to listen and to catch the right pattern and then to, to, to quickly catch up because she can learn. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. So that I was like, okay, now I know why we homeschooled. You know, like I understand what the, uh, the advantage was. It was really giving them, teaching them to be a person first. And then, you know, after that, you can just let them loose and they'll do whatever. They'll be fine. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a lot of cool things that like branches that are popping off as the conversation is opening up. Um, the one that I think has the most, it feels to me like right now it has the most relevance was going back to the moment where the parent is attending the child and the way that the child has a relationship with, with another person. In this case, now we may even invoke with another consciousness. Um, and then thinking about, cause you actually, you made a very specific reference and I, I'd like to, to bring it out um, to the, uh, what's that? I'm going to, I'm going to do a twist. So as inside, so outside or as outside, so inside mm -hmm. the, the notion of the, the first thing the child is in relationship with is their own interior. There's their, the quality of the, of the way that they themselves are showing up in life. Of course, as a child, if the in, you know, if for newborn, the distinction is not a distinction. So even the process of actually being able to um, sense the difference between what is them and what is mom, for example, yeah. is the first thing. Um, and so in a, in a very lived way, one of the very first practices that we were, that we practiced, my wife and I with our, our infant, this came from the, that program that I mentioned, was before we would pick her up or before we would give, allow anyone else to hold her, we would just you know, create a, a structure like this, your hands open, and then give her the time, which as a, as a I'm not a newborn, but within two or three weeks, it actually began to land to sense that something was, that there was a kind of a possibility of relationship in this case to be held. Mm. And then to signal whether or not that possibility of relationship was consented to, like, is this a yes? And the point there is to actually create a, a feeling of, in the interior of the child, the experience, the implicit experience, right? Not the conscious experience, obviously we're talking about a, a one month old, but the implicit like, uh, how do I say this, without a, without, a, without a lot of noise, but a lot of like, clarity of signal of what does it feel like in me when there's a feeling of yes to something. Um, and so I've noticed that that's actually been part of a stack. Like there's been a building of that, that because she has an ability to sense in herself when she is, would you say, closer to, or um, the, the, you had some terms like the, the many and the, and the single, yeah, the but one and the many. This... And then the, the straight and the, and the crooked, right? Yeah. It's to actually in herself, like, okay. So it's, a, it's like that, ah, okay, cool. It's that first person, third person distinction. You know, not that's crooked, that's straight. Third person, top down visual, can you just yeah. tell the pattern? But rather, as you're looking at straight and crooked, are you always able to feel in yourself what yourself is actually telling you how to make that distinction? What's that distinction feel like in you so that when you come across it in any context, now, without having to do this sort of weird um, semantic mapping, you're actually able to just look at it and go, oh, I've never experienced this before in my life, but I'm pretty sure that's in the direction of straightness. Yeah, yeah, and you don't even think it. It just happens. That's, that's, a, that's why it's so, it's so interesting that a, a, so much of what we are is just about being with other people, and it's just about, and I mean, and I say that I'm on YouTube and I'm talking and I'm explaining stuff to people, you know, so it's, not, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but so much of, of what we are is just this, like we're communal beings. We, when we're meant to be together and we learn from each other. And so you can kind of understand the idea, you know, of a, of a saint or a, of a starret, you know, like a, a spiritual guide or something, this notion that even just being in, with someone who has attained a, certain moral level or a certain spiritual level that can transform you. They can, it can change you just by being in contact with somebody because a lot of it is implicit. It's like, you're not, it's not so much, it's not just the idea of getting a teaching from somebody, but it is a, it is somewhat how like imbibing their being. And so then mm. once you kind of get that, you can understand why people want to go to rock concerts, why people want to meet, you know, stars and all this stuff. It's a, it's a caricature in a way. I mean, it's not a caricature. It's the actual thing, but it's, it's a bit, maybe a little bit debased version of the desire to be with holy people or to be with someone who is manifesting something in the world. You know, it's like the, this, this person is, 
they're, they're, they're just, it, I mean, I would say that I think that seeing what happened to Jordan Peterson, to me, I saw something of that where it was, it was like, cause he wasn't really, sometimes he wasn't even saying much like, or he keeps repeating the same things, obviously, you know, I mean, after you've done a thousand shows, it's like, you, you're obviously repeating, you have to repeat yourself. You can't just be always saying new things. And, and, and then people just want to be there in the room and be in the room where he's saying the same thing that he said, you know, 10 times on his YouTube channel. Uh, and so it's like, it, that's when you realize just how much, so much of knowledge and so much of who we are is just about, that's why I use the word love because it's, it's, it's about this actual connection with somebody. It's, it's more than just propositional. Oh, nice. You invoked it. I was like, wondering, um, like that propositional down to participatory stack yeah. that, uh, and by the way, I'm just going to keep calling him Johnny B because I hope that it enters into the common vernacular. Johnny feels B. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that um, the Johnny V brought. Like, I didn't have that, th those concepts before I watched mm. his stuff. Um, and I feel like that's just a really nice, concrete, but fundamental way of just helping understand that there's just such a distinction. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I, I myself have personally had the experience many times of just of, of imbibing another mm. person. And noticing, by the way, uh, that, you know, if you're in a particular moment and you're having a conversation with someone the thing that is happening at the propositional level, while it may or may not be the intention, like right now, like the conversation that we're having explicitly at the propositional level is almost certainly the least important thing that's actually happening. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more going on. And, if, and uh, I've noticed this if I like watch the comments, by the, obviously, right? Everybody who's watching something or reading something or participating in something is absorbing the piece that is most um, imbibable by them, you know, for which they have the most thirst and for which they have the most taste. Yeah. I've been watching the John Verveke stuff quite a bit. Uh, so maybe I would like to, to, to think about some of the things that he's talking about, especially if you just talk with them. I'm probably going to be doing more discussion with him, maybe an event even here in Canada. So it's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. I really appreciate the language that he's giving in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, and I think he really understands a lot of the, a lot of the problem, especially the problem of progress. I don't know if he sees it that way, but he understands the, 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 the myth of, he doesn't understand it, but he's describing something which can help people understand why progress is so problematic because it's always like you're gripping and then you're letting go. And so if you grip too tight, then you let go. You have to create this opt, you have to, what he calls this optimal grip or whatever. Uh, and everything is like that, where there's this optimal grip but it's always changing and it's, you always have to kind of shift it in order to move it. And so you'll hear politicians say things like, you know, we have to centralize. Centralizing is, the, is progress. And then they'll centralize and they'll centralize, they'll exaggerate. And then once they've centralized so much, then they see all the downsides of centralization, lack of particularity, lack of attention to, to, to a particular problem. They're like, no, 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 we need to decentralize, decentralize, and then decentralize everything. And so this, and then decentralizing is progress, right? Decentralizing is progress. And they don't understand that, that the, the very trade-off that you're, it's always there, that trade-off. Like if you want the medical system to be completely centralized into one gigantic state run thing, then yeah, it's going to be efficient. It's going to do all that. And then at some point you're going to run into all the problems of the particulars. If you want to decentralize, it's going to be dealing with everybody's local problems and it's going to be great. It's going to be super expensive. And then it, it's also going to lack cohesive discussion between the, the experts. Like you just can't avoid that problem. It, it's just, and so that's the, that's why, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, why progress is, is it, to me is an illusion, it's especially like social or moral progress. Uh, it, it's always finding that optimal grip. There's a great quote by Rumi, which I, I really find beautiful. He talks about, I won't quote it directly. He talks about how uh, if you keep your hand open or your hand closed, you know, that's par par paralysis, like you're paralyzed. It's like you, your hand needs to slightly open and close like the wings of a butterfly. And that is how you exist in the world. It's like this, always this in breathing in, breathing out, you know, that's the rhythm of, of existence. You can't just breathe in and think that you're, oh, I'm progressing. I've got more air and I've just keep <laughs> adding more air, more air, more air. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. You have to, you have to breathe out. Uh, and so I think that, that that the language of this kind of optimal grip stuff that he talks about, I find it's extremely useful for people to understand 
you know, why complexity looks the way it does, why efficiency isn't always the answer, you know, that, that the idea that you can make a, a robot that's more and more efficient, that somehow you think that you're going to solve the problem. It's like, no, because as it becomes efficient, then you'll have the problem, the other problem, which is the problem of all the particular questions, all the, the exceptions, all these things that, that are real and that you have to deal with. Um, yeah. Anyways, that's the stuff I've been thinking about just because I, I listened to some of his podcasts uh, today and yesterday. So I was like, that's what I was thinking about, about. Well, the thing that my mind turned to, there's a lot of things I was noticing, for example, um, I'm not sure if any of this, what I'm about to say is even vaguely interesting or useful, but in any event is where we are. Um, as you were talking, I was noticing in, in my, in my mind, um, different frameworks that were kind of loading up to potentially make sense. Um, so for example, as you were talking about uh, centralized and decentralized, uh, healthcare, yeah. Um, I, was actually, I was actually loading up a paradigm in uh, graph theory and network theory um, that's actually able to do a really good job making sense of that particular thing. It's almost like, you know, as we're talking, there's a sense of like flipping through the, the toolkits or flipping through the, 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 the lenses or even maybe the, the tones or the instruments. Like, okay, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? To be present to what's happening now. Um, and I was just noticing, like, as I was sitting there, I was actually noticing that it was building up inside of me. And then the thing that dropped was actually kind of looping back to this question of our, of our sandbox, of our, this character who has, a, has an obligate um, set of ways of, of mind, a sort of a pretty um, progressive mind in, in the sense that you're using, meaning that there's a, uh, an over-efficiency, an over-fit, over an over-optimization for a particular uh, way of being in relationship with the world. Um, and in particular, one that seems to have actually um, lost this ability, right? So there's two, there's, there's, there's two problems. One problem is if you're this all the time, that's problem one. Problem two is when you've actually forgotten that you could ever do this. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, so we can actually use it as a metaphor. Now we have this funny thing where you know, we have this moment where in the very beginning, Sandbox Sam has first person consciousness as the base. And then moment two, Sorry, moment one, like from zero to one, it just goes like, like that and it sticks there. Like that, exactly. right, there's nothing in between. So you're like, huh. Um, so there's something about that. Like there's something about, and we can even say, well, there's, it's in some sense obvious that the, the exact kind of culture that generates politicians who operate in this way, because there's a co-evolutionary dynamic, generates individuals who have minds that operate in this way. And there's a lot of really good, rich stuff that if we wanted to, we could double click on and explore both the history of how we got here the um, parameters of why we got here in the way that we did. And then of course the, the, the choice that we might, what might it mean for us to find a way out of where we are, which I would say is, is, is a bit stuck. Like the, the kind of mind and the kind of culture that shows up in this way has a lot of stuckness because, yeah. you know, if it turns out somebody's throwing a baseball at you and having a hand that can't close, you're going to have a very hard time catching it. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think, one of the problems I think that got us stuck <laughs> is I think, I think that we, we have accepted the, to me, we've accepted the revolutionary ideal. Like we've accepted that culture is opposite. Let's say that true culture is oppositional. That, mm. you know, the artist is an oppositional figure that all culture is there to oppose. And, you know, the rock, rock and roll, punk rock aesthetic, all of that is what we've accepted. And so we all understand the world. I mean, it's, it's not just, it's not recent, you know, it's Marxism. It's, it's even, even before Marx, you know, this idea of this kind of radical dialectic, we've accepted the idea that the world works through, through, uh, through opposition. And so because of that, what happens is people will flip, like people can actually flip from one to the other. They don't even realize, but they still are always inhabiting this kind of oppositional, this kind of oppositional mode. And, and especially, and democracy, is part of that creates that issue too because you end up you inevitably end up having two parties and then you have it's in the u.s is like such a picture perfect image it's like it is country just split 50 50 right down the middle it's almost like a it's like a you could it's, it's almost like a cosmic image where if you set up two opposites well that's what's going to happen it's going to sit up in the middle and people are going to take one side and people are going to take the other even sometimes the sides aren't even coherent 
in in themselves like if you look at the positions that all the republicans hold they're not actually totally coherent and the and the democrats are not totally coherent but they just swallow one side and the other and then it's just it's just we have to we have to fight what, we have to what's fight meaningfully out. coherent is their critique of the other side like yeah if exactly. you actually look at it the story they tell about the other side's weaknesses is the most coherent part of their platform yeah and so i mean it's a it's a it's a very dangerous is definitely a very dangerous way. The ancient way was dangerous too in a different way because usually coherence would be on the inside and the opposition would be on the outside. So you know you have you have the Roman Empire and if you're Roman and if you're if you're if you're an actual Roman citizen you're right in the center and if you're kind of periphery peripheral to the Roman citizens then you're a little further out and then you, you know then you have people that are a little further out and then finally you have the barbarians that were fighting and that we're trying to fight off. And so there's a, the coherence sets itself up in a hierarchy and the opposition happens towards the outside. And so that has a very dangerous, it has a de- dangerous aspect because you end up dehumanizing those that are outside. But now with, the, with democracy and a kind of dialectical thinking, what we've ended up creating is the enemy within. It's, so it's like inside your thing, you set up an opposition. And so then your enemy is your neighbor. And so, man, that is, a, that is a, it seems like that's a dangerous place to stand, especially if it ramps up. If it, you know, if it stays at the low level, just discussion, it's not a big deal. But as we're watching it ramp up, yeah, it's a frightening to me. Well, I've seen some, I've seen thing. some very good arguments. I've seen some very good arguments that it, it inevitably ramps up. Yeah. Because as you say, it's almost like a, there's a, the, the, the paradigm that popped up for me to kind of make sense of that initially was the notion of a, evolutionary landscape Mm -hmm. and so there's like a a a niche a really high quality niche over here in left space a really high quality niche over here in right space and there's a niche construction where if i'm in right space the more i move to the right once there's like a stable a a stable place in right space like i I, in america is like eisenhower republicans the 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 farther a slightly farther right version of that is ever so slightly more fit as long as it's able to distance itself from that which further left. And mm-hmm. so there's a built-in pressure to select for more and more polarization yeah. because it just ke- keeps that middle, which is really the actual danger to the, to the, to the dyadic structure. Um, what I was wondering was if there's a way to imagine what else? Why uh, not? You mean da- In real I mean, time right now. Besides, besides the king, David? <laughs> or a queen. <laughs> in the sense, the no, I, I mean, I, I joke, I joke, but I think that the idea of having characters or or uh, of having characters that transcend the political, I think that that's the key. So mm-hmm. I say a king or a queen, yeah, it can be that, and it has been in the past. Not that that's not problematic, but it can be saints too. It can be holy people that that are that stand above the fray, uh, you know. There was a time, for example, in the U.S. where someone like Billy Graham, for all the criticism that I could, you know, I'm not a particular fan of Billy Graham, but someone like Billy Graham actually stood above politics and he would meet with with presidents on both sides and he represented a kind of father figure for the nation and everybody could agree that Billy Graham's a good guy, you know, uh, even if I don't agree with him. And uh, and so it, it feels like the 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 current state, let's say, and, and maybe like in, the, in America, maybe one of the things that actually played that role for a little while was, was kind of entertainment. I think it's a, it's a it's, once again, it's a debased version, but uh, you know, you had uh, these, let's say the talk show host of, uh, of the, the Johnny Carson talk show host type, where he was speaking to everybody and everybody could tune in to Johnny Carson and could watch Johnny Carson and there was no politics. There was no, there was no polarization in the, in the talk show it doesn't mean that people didn't have their polarized views but it just wasn't there and so now it's weird because now even in entertainment things have polarized really strongly in terms of mostly left on the left Uh, but now we're seeing you know with with uh with certain movements like alternative media and uh comics gate and all this stuff we're seeing this this other side which is which is coming about and is Mm -hmm. is is uh getting let's say it's getting bigger yeah, so my friend Zach Stein, have you guys met Zach at all? Uh, he's, his, his thing is education um, and meta psychology, which is, I think, very consonant with Johnny B's vision of 
fourth generation cognitive science, as, as I understand it. Um, and one of the quotes in his recent book actually has to, to precise with this notion that in, in the States, in uh, the US, as the, the place, the locus, and I would say the proper locus for the cultivation of meaningfulness and connectedness, which is to say, the family, most, most, most meaningfully, and then to the community, the lived community, secondarily, um, evaporated. Yeah. There was a, a, a mapping or a grasping for that in media and school, which is a uniquely bad place to locate that particular developmental need. Yeah. Um, and also, having grown up in America in that context, and born in 71, um, I mean, I remember the time when you would go to school and we would all just talk about the TV show that we all watched. So there was a way to maintain, and it's almost like a Roman style coherence, as you say. And there's a notion of, okay, we're the in-group because we all watch this show and we can all talk about the same, uh, almost like mythopoetic structures we share. We're keeping up to space, up to date on the meta narrative that is our, our culture, our poor, pitiful, commercialized and poorly written culture starring David Hasselhoff. But nonetheless, it's something. It's yeah. something coherent. Um, and then as you, and, and both at a media level, because of the, the deconstruction of some narrow broadcast channels, you know, moving into cable and eventually into the internet, um, and also at the level of the sort of the um, continuous metabolism of meaningfulness into uh, acrimony that seems to just be built into the heartbeat of the way the particular structure of our culture is designed has also done that. So it's polarized. So it's fragmented and then polarized. Um, so even those things that are not at all good for holding and conveying meaningfulness are now also absent, which I think is a pretty good finger to point in the direction of the meaning crisis. Yeah. And, it, and it's interesting. I'm, as you said that, I, was, I, I kind of was reminded that one of the places that the Romans tried to find, uh, let's say, togetherness was in their entertainment. So, I mean, the circus, for all its horribleness, was a way, I mean, because also it was violent entertainment, just like our entertainment is violent, uh, was a way for Romans to to be together, right? It would to, to, to experience the same catharsis uh, at the same time. And so it was, you know, as the Romans became less religious, you know, uh, especially after after Augustus and things started to kind of to fragment there at that, at that time, uh, it seems like the circus was a place for them to, to, to come together. But it's a, fra I think it's a fragile, you know, the idea of finding yourself in entertainment, it, it's, it can last a little while, but I don't think it's, it's strong enough. Yes. Yeah. I like, I like, um, I'm mapping right now to a, a, a guy, an author named Carol Quigley. He was a historian in the mid century. He wrote a really good book called the evolution of civilizations. And one of the things he talked about is that the golden age is actually always the death knell of a civilization. That what yeah. has happened is, is that it's closed, it's optimized, yeah. it's become progressive, and its, its <clears throat> vitality is being exchanged for its for our hypertrophication of the things that it identifies as success. So it gets a whole lot of, you know, in this case, gold, <laughs> but it actually is losing uh, vitality, losing meaningfulness, losing connectedness, losing religion in the deep sense. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably, there's a map in there, which is to say that almost at the, at the moment, if you, if you shifted at the center of the way that your society is maintaining its integrity as a coherent culture is living in the domain of media, you are already dead. <laughs> yeah, it, it for may sure. Not be, it may not, you, the body may not hit the ground for a little while. <laughs> that's right. Depending on how big you are and what's going yeah. on, but yeah. death has already set in. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, and I think that, no, I, I mean, I think that it's interesting because we probably wouldn't, it would have been difficult for us to perceive it at the dawn of television. You know, we wouldn't, but now it's become so obvious and we can see the trace, we can see the line from television to Facebook and we can see it breaking down. And now it's like, it's too late because we're all on Facebook, we're all on these social medias. We all, when we see how, how, how they're a caricature of relationships and that how they're alienating to our, you know, I keep saying that Facebook is the ultimate version of the star system that we've created with media and TV and movies and everything, where everybody is a mini star. It's like, you, that's what it is. It's like, you're, you can have a little bit of stardom. And so you're not actually in relationship with anybody. You're just exposing yourself. And then everybody is watching you. 
Uh -huh. and they're, they're not right. at you. And so they can comment on your thing, but they, they don't have to. They, you can expose yourself. And so it's exposing and voyeurism. Uh, and it pretends to be actual community, but it's Pretending actually just a, attending. Yeah. It's just a little form of stardom. And so it's, it's shrunk down to the individual. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you can imagine that that, that that has the characteristic of collapsing further and further until you're not even attending to yourself. Yeah. Everything is performative. You're performing for yourself. You're performing for your friends. And it's all a simulation, which um, another guy who I've, I've just finally like grasped, this guy named uh, Baudrillard, yeah. talked about like stages or levels of simulation and how the yeah. levels of simulation convert into each other. And you know, again, we can kind of look back and say, oh, okay, we're, we're at stage four. I can see three, two, and one now because we've got enough perspective on it. Um, but then you get back to the fact that this nice thing, at least for the moment, um, and I'm kind of like remembering AI and once again, kind of shutting it behind the steel door. <laughs> we had 38 minutes yet? <laughs> um, is the, this return, like the, the remembering that you talked about earlier is that, that is in some sense always available. Yeah. That even though we found ourselves alienated in every dimension, you know, this, the suburbs and the television are part of the same machinery. Like you, you walk around, and by the way, where I live, you walk down the street and they ain't nobody out. What are they doing? Well, they're inside, either that's watching right. TV or staring at their phone and that's it. So the capacity for people to live in a context where there's no human contact is only facilitated by the fact that they can get the simulacrum of human contact from media, but because they can get the simulacrum of human contact from media super saliently, like, okay, Thor is a lot more interesting than your neighbor. Yeah. So then you don't go outside. And so you get this positive or, or, or self-reinforcing destructive cycle. But remembering is always available. And yeah. I, I sense a renaissance. I mean, and this is, again, you point to Jordan Peterson. I, this is what I, I identify as being the most fundamental lesson of that event mm -hmm. is the degree to which there was a recognition on the part of a very large number of people who were extremely thirsty to imbibe something that was real, that there was something real. Um, and maybe not for everyone and maybe not completely real, but yeah. real and for the people who drank it, it was a thing they needed, um, which kicks something off. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, I agree I, in the sense that I've seen it myself. I've seen people, you know, I can see it in their eyes. You can see the change that they're, that they have this, this like little sparkle. <laughs> and so that's great. That's wonderful. Uh, and it, but it is, it's very, it's very difficult. And that's maybe, that's one of the things that I, struggle with in terms of Jordan and in terms of Brett and in terms of Brett Weinstein and all these people is that <clears throat> maybe that's why also I'm the, the explicit Christian in this whole thing is that mm -hmm. I, I don't see how his thing stack, how this stacks up, you know, and I'm really struggling to see how it stacks up because <clears throat> one of the things that let's say Jordan talks about is the individual. And I understand he says it and he doesn't do it in a, in a kind of individualist sense. He talked about, Ha taking responsibility, you know, taking responsibility for, 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 for things and being an active agent in the world, fixing the things around you, your community and everything. And, but it has to, it still has to stack up. It has to stack up to a higher degree. It's like, if you do that, let's say you, you fix your family and you do that, then there, those families also have to come together. And then those families have to come together. There has to be, it has to, has to go up higher. It has to come together in a higher sense. And so that's why I'm always invoking, I try to invoke, let's say, the medieval village as an image of, a, of an actual village, of an actual town, which has a, a hierarchy in the very architecture of the town, where you have the highest point of the town is the church steeple. It's usually at the center of the town. The town gets built around this church. That's the place, that's our, that's it. Like that's the highest point. That's what we all look towards. We know that that's what binds us together. And so we, we go there to be bound to, to experience a common identity. And then we go back into our homes and we reproduce that identity in our families. And then we reproduce that in ourselves. Now I'm going top down. I know everybody's trying to go bottom up. That's fine. I, I don't have a problem with the bottom up, but I, but I also think it's important to something to describe it coming top, top down. So, and I think that, so that, what that ends up looking like to a certain extent is identity. You can't get away from it. And so the desire to, so it's like, how, do, how can we deal with that? How can we deal with the reality of identities as this stacks up 
and not ignore it, but then also not create the danger of the extreme, let's say, rigid identity that we saw in, uh, in 20th century nationalism. And so, but there, but there has to be, I, it has to stack up towards identities. You can't, you can't just be a bunch of individuals and then have what the state, like have just this anonymous, what is post-national state uh, country, like Justin Trudeau said about Canada. So, so Canada is the first identity, post-national country. What do you mean when you say identity? Well, well, one, like you, I mean, it can it's be all kinds of identity. Clans, identity like really like clans, like, uh, like exactly like religious identities, like saying I'm a Christian, saying I'm a Canadian, Got saying okay. I'm a French Canadian, that I share uh, a common history, a common, uh, re- you know, a, a common identity with other people. All these identities, they, 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 and they are inevitable in, in how the world stacks up. And so I feel like no one, at least like in this IDW group, everybody wants to avoid identity because they're saying, I you know, it has the, the sovereignty of the individual, everything, identity is dangerous, identity is dangerous. It's like, you can't, if, if it stacks up, you can't avoid it. So we need to find a balance. We need to talk about how we can find a way to balance these identities without, because that's what, let's say like, that's the big, biggest, biggest criticism coming from the extreme right for people like Jordan Peterson. They're saying, you're ignoring identity. You're, you're pretending like it doesn't exist when it obviously, it's going to exist. It's going to to happen, but then they go way too far and they're like, okay, so now we're going to be, what is it like, you know, it's like the white race and all this, all these, to me, the, that's a bogus identity, but there are real identities yeah. in terms of cultural identities and yeah, all that. So here, I think again, the word coherence probably is uh, the way I would describe the thing that replaces identity, that plays the role that I think is what you're talking about. Um, and by the way, it has particularly that characteristic of top down. Um, so it's what we might call the, what is it that enables things at the bottom to actually come together into things that have an, have an identity, meaning a meaningfulness as a unit, a beingness as, as such that is real, like actually effective in world. And, and we can be very concrete. It's like, if one of them gets old and infirm, the others stick around and support them. Like that's, that's what it means for that to be a real thing. Yeah. Um, and then for that to also be able to come together in, in, in higher and higher levels of, well, frankly, just scale, as you said, you know, the, the, in the, the small family, the distributed family, the village, the, you know, what we might call the, the bioregion, whatever it is, right. Some structural element that has a, 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 a vastness and all the way ultimately to the, to the whole thing, like the whole, all, the whole world, um, yeah. which I think. It may or may not have been clear in the in the video that you watched that I talked about, but that's one of the things that I spend a lot of time trying to point out is that that's where we are. Like we're we're at a moment where it's no longer really an option of do we learn how to actually live peaceably with all of our neighbors, because our capacity to destroy things has become is just getting more, larger and larger and larger every day. And so, what was a beautiful uh, proposition two thousand years ago is now simply what has to happen. Right? This is just very practical. So the image, the image that came to my mind, well, I actually had two. One was I, I'm going back to your image of the hand opening and closing, right? So one of the problems with identity is when it does that, and it's an obligate and, and then forgotten. Right? So I am not Roman, but there's something about Romanness that is helpful in me being able to have a way of being in relationship with the people around me. So if, I, if I somehow, what's the term? not defer, but almost like the fundamental sovereignty of the singularity of my soul as connected to the divine. If I give that into something which is in fact less than that, then I am actually engaging in a profane act. So that I can't do. That, that is, in terms of the language of identity, it's, it's doing this and then forgetting that you could ever close your hand. Right? So to become the identity, to become a revolutionary Frenchman or to become an Irish Republican or to become a, uh, um, well, I'm from Texas, to become a Texan. Um, as opposed to being what, in fact, what you really are, which is vastly greater than any of the things that could ever be, and yet also being able to use those as we're being in relationship. So that's one side. So then the other side is, okay, what would it mean? What does it mean to actually be able to identify? And this is almost for me, I'm saying, let's design it. Let's think about what are the design characteristics of the thing that you're talking about? Well, um, to me, the thing that I'm talking about, it looks like, I mean, it does, 
it, it looks like a medieval village is what it looks like. It, that, that the structure of it, that's what it looks like to me is that there's something, there's a transcendent center. There's a yep. center which is actually not of this world. It's not, yep. it, it, it's beyond everything. It, and uh, and that that's where we actually meet. It's not there, you know, it's, there's signs around it. There's a church and there's a holy, there's an altar and there's a cup and in the cup there's, there's, there's wine and there's bread, but it's not there. It's all, it's, it's, the, it's the seed and the seed and the seed and the seed. It's like, it's hidden. It's a hidden reality. It's the, it's a, you know, it's, yeah, it's the, the pattern hidden in the, in the world. So that's what is transcendent. And like you said, that reaches from there all the way down to me in being created in the image of God. And so it's like, that's the line. And then along that line, then we have communion, communions of love that will manifest themselves. And so you'll have, and, and those will be hierarchical in, in a proper sense, in the sense that there are those that are above us and their, their, their responsibility is to care for those that are below and those that are below are there to provide, you know, uh, that which comes from below, provide food, provide uh, whatever is needed for the, 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 the thing that's above to, to be able to care for you. Um, and so it's like it's that. Just I mean, can I say support? Because it creates a nice symmetry. There you, you go. Support. Care and you got support. Yeah, care and care support. support. There nice you go. That's a that's a better word. Yeah, it's a good word. Um, and so to me, that's what that's what it that's what it looks like. That's the to me that seems to be the only possible structure for that to to happen. Like you need something. You need a tra the invisible transcendent in the center. Or else it doesn't. It doesn't. Or else it stops. And or else it becomes nationalism. It becomes this and that. It becomes. You know, so and then is, even in terms of religion, like if we don't understand that it's a mystery, mm -hmm. we don't understand that, let's say, that God transcends all, all, transcends everything, transcends even our religious, you know, even the religious frame that we have, then that's also a danger because then we have, then we have, you know, the crusades, we have religious wars or whatever. Yep. Um, but if, if we, but if we can fully see that beyond, even, even though, let's say the revelation that we have or the church building, the tradition we have is true that beyond that God is always beyond. God is always beyond, beyond, beyond is not, cannot be contained, cannot be, cannot be framed. He's beyond. So to me, that's the only way for it to, to actually work. I don't see another way, but maybe, maybe it's just because, I mean, maybe that, that you can understand by my whole story, by why I am who I am, why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's like, obviously, I've taken that, I've drank that Kool-Aid. And so now I, my life lays itself out that way. Well, I, fortunately uh, for this conversation, I don't, I didn't drink that Kool-Aid and yet I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice. Um, I, I came through this to this place through a very different road and it's a road that looked a lot more like Sam Harris to be perfectly mm. frank. So I, uh, I can have a first person experience of what it is to have an obligate third person mind. Um, and one where my, my metaphysics, right, and I'm actually going to use that to be more foundational than ontology, uh, didn't include the transcendent in, in any meaningful way. Um, meaning there was not a way of actually grasping the meaning of transcendence a, as an aspect of, of uh, the whole thing. We can't, can't actually say reality or world. It's actually bigger than that, and that's the whole point. Um, and so in this conversation, we've actually noticed now three things. So if I think about, and I think this is, I think, I think there's a very precise piece here. It's not quite right, but it's a little bit. So we have our sandbox Sam over here, who is kind of representing um, the aspect of the whole thing that we might call science. Like I actually, I wrote an, I wrote an article that actually had this in it. Um, not, not Sam in it, but the, 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 these distinctions. So we might call science. Um, knowing semantics, propositional knowledge, models of reality, those kinds of things, um, which are a part, like they're definitely a part. And these are, those are the frames, like you're talking about frames, creating frames, putting in, things in frames is very useful. And it's a part of, of the thing. Then we have, and I, here I'm kind of just forcing the fit, but it's not terrible. It's we now have, um, hmm, I can't do sandbox Jordan. We can do jumping Jordan. No, that's just too hilarious. Sorry. Sandbox Jordan, um, who's kind of representing uh, living, livingness, like the actual, um, like you said, like take responsibility for yourself, take responsibility for your family, um, live it in life. D does it, does it actually allow and support you in thriving? Then it's a good choice, blah, 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 that whole story. And those are not the same. Like those are distinct. And I'm actually, by the way, this is going to be a little bit challenging, but I map in my own language. So this is just semantics right at this point. 
um, I actually map with, with the thing that Jordan Peterson is doing as religion, um, as, as distinct from science. And then the third that you're calling out, which I do imagine, it does seem to me right, is missing at least explicitly in either of the previous two sandbox people, is the transcendent, which then I'll just tag as mystery. And one can, one can include mystery and religion, but I, I maintain it's important to hold them separately uh, because they are in fact different. Uh, at least that category, the notion of the livingness and the rituals and the use of the processions and all the, the things that we do that enable us to be bound in real bodies living with each other. And then that feeling and the sense of connectedness to the transcendent all the way up and down at these different levels is a different quality. And you have, so those are three different things. And one of the things that I've noticed in most conversations is that most conversations either don't have all three of those things, quite often they lack uh, one or two of them, or um, the phrase that I used in my article was they cross the streams, invoking, remember our last vestige of culture, pop culture, Ghostbusters. So, you know, science doing religion or religion doing science or mystery doing science or mystery doing religion, yeah, 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 thing. Yeah. and if you just can hold them and say, okay, the, you know, the transcendent is, is is you know it's part of the, part of the thing you have to have the transcendent if you want to do what we're trying to do um, and so the, when you say I'm, I'm curious about when you say that you said the transcendent isn't part of your metaphysics and so then maybe maybe it's also no, no, the, the, I know, i'm saying the transcendent is part of my metaphysics oh it is sorry i thought what, you said it what, is i was like what, okay. I, what i notice is that it's often absent from the conversation yeah exactly yeah no and, and or, to or me, alternatively okay. too present and other things are absent which is equally problematic yeah, but also because people often, they don't, they, I, I feel like a lot of people, especially the modern Christians, they have this weird two world view of, of reality. You know, it's like there's God in heaven and there's, there's things here and somehow separate. Like, I don't, I'm, I'm way more of a Platonist. Like I'm way more of a Platonist in the sense that, you know, the transcendent happens at all levels. That things transcend at all levels. It, they're in the, if you're holding a cup, the identity of the cup is not in the cup. You can't find it. It's, if you try to, if you accumulate the parts of the cup, you'll never get to the identity of the cup. The, the identity cup necessarily transcends the, the cup. And that's true of a family. It's true of a country. It's true of everything. And so it's like, if you just keep, if you keep doing that at some point, it's like, you just keep having things which transcend the accumulation of particulars. It seems like transcendence is just a part of, of uh, of reality, people call it emergence because they don't like the word transcendence. But like I said, you can see it bottom up if you want, but you can also see it top down. Uh, to me, those two are the same. Uh, it's just a different. Just you just stand in different ways and, and just stand in different places to look at it. I, I, by the way, I'd, I'd add the, the middle as well. So you can have bottom up, top down, and right in the middle. <laughs> well, there's a great quote. Unpleasant. There's a great quote by uh, Saint Maximus the Confessor, who's a who's a mystic. He talks about how he talks about the mystic who perceives the identities of things and their particulars separate. So he can see the spiritual essences and he can see the, the particulars of something. Uh, you know, he can see them both. And then he realizes that they actually don't contradict each other at all, that they actually are there together, that they, 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 they represent the same reality. That it's not, that's the, that is really the incarnational way of thinking. That's to me, that's the highest Christian understanding of the world is, is, that you know it's platonic in the sense that it believes in the reality of essences but it's not platonic in the sense that it also believes that those essences have to be incarnated they have to have bodies mm -hmm. and so it's like it's the meeting of the two that middle that you talked about that's where reality happens it's in where the, the, the where the essences and the and the particulars meet that's where the one and the many where it meets that's it that's the world that's life that's life yeah yeah in fact when I was earlier struggling with trying to not use the word real, I would say where they meet is what is real. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Totally. Yeah. I was just going to interject. I mean, we're getting towards probably about an hour or so now. Yep. Um, and I, but I just wanted to ask one question. If you've got like a couple of minutes more. Sure. Yeah. Um, what I was hearing you say, Jonathan, about we need to rescue um, a sense of the transcendent. We, I know we've talked before about the need for either a, a place where religion we need something in the place where religion used to be or we need I, I mean I guess you would 
you would probably say that we've got one. We need to renew. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's right. Go ahead. Um, and also, I heard you say, Jordan, that you didn't, what I heard you say was you didn't grow up with a place for the transcendent or that wasn't part of your metaphysics, but you've learned that that needs to be, there needs to be a place for the transcendent. I'd love to hear where, where you might come together. What, what needs to be in that space where religion used to be, or how do we renew that sense of the transcendent? Uh, well, the, the first, there's a bunch of things that come up for me. So, um, the first thing that I notice is like, I guess, care or carefulness or the, the, in fact, it's funny. So even as a word, the word sacred is about to leave my mouth. I immediately want to warn, be careful because the world that we live in doesn't have a clue what that means more or less. Uh, a lot of this has to do with this obligate third person that we've been talking about. So, um, or, a lack of carefulness with the recognition that the very notion of the transcendent can't be held in the words you're using to describe it. It doesn't matter what frame you're using. It was whether you're drawing it or speaking it or dancing it, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, is at best a symbol pointing towards that, which it is certainly not, right? And so to be able to recover or to perhaps remember a capacity and a facility, the capacity and the facility for actually being in relationship with the transcendent is a real thing. Right. So this is a, a key. You can't try to force March toolkits that were used for creating models of reality into doing the work of the transcendent. They're gonna, it's not going to work. They're, they're going to be like, what the hell's going on here? It doesn't make any sense because it doesn't make sense in the context of toolkits for using making models of reality and semantic structures. Right? It's just that's not the thing. But that isn't to say that there isn't a thing. There is a thing. We just have to actually relearn or remember how to do it. And some of the places we were talking about, like this difference between pretending and attending in relationship with your child is a really good place to learn that thing and to make it very grounded, right? Because the other thing was we have, we have this, again, a, a, because of the mistake of the way that we've embodied the transcendent where we try to point ourselves at it, is we have a sense of the transcendent as being somehow too big. Right? It's, it's, it can't possibly be present to the moment of my relationship with my child because it's actually this vastness that is you know, bigger than mountains. When in fact, the reality is, is that it has to be present in every moment and every yeah. experience and every relationship. And so learning and being in relationship with it at that level is a great way of grounding it and like, oh, oh okay. It's actually not um, crazy talk. It's not fantasy. It's actually as real as the particulars, right? It's, yeah. it's the, the particulars and the transcendent come together into what is real. And so rebuilding a facility and a capacity to speak about it or at least to point and orient our, our, our actions and choices in relationship with it is a tricky business. It has to be done with a lot of care. Yeah, no, I, I think I agree with everything you said, but of course, then, then I'll add my little thing, which is, you know, I talked a little bit before about the problem the modern world has in terms of oppositional thinking, that, mm. we, that we've set our reality in terms of opposition. Uh, and I think that once I realized that, or once I realized that, one of the problems is this oppositional attitude. And so once I, once I kind of got that, I realized, okay, so I don't, I don't need to see my place in history as oppositional. I don't need to see myself as having to get rid of that which is before. Rather, I need to shine as much light as I can on that which was before. Make it bright, make it, mm. make it uh, alive. Um, and so to me, the, the solution, because we are all from, I mean, we all share a, a similar history. All the people here that are talking, we're all European descent. We're all, uh, you know, we, our, our ancestors were all, were all, at least our ancestors were all Christians, probably not that far behind. And so, you know, maybe one generation, maybe maximum two generations behind. Uh, and so to me, the, the, the solution is, is to reconnect or to recohere, to remember all of these things is what I want. And I don't want, and I want to, to like I said, sh make that which we had as bright as possible so that, it, so that it's alive today, so that it can carry us, so that it can, it can give us a sense of place, a sense of a place in the continuity of time, a place in space, and a place in terms of our communities. And I know it's not easy because the fragmentation is so strong in our community, but I, I don't, in terms of the scaling up that I talked about before, um, that's the only thing I see. I see all the other types of mm. movements, the kind of mm -hmm. neo-religious movements and these kind of 
pseudo religious or kind of quasi religious movements. I see them as uh, participating in the in the breakdown in terms of the higher. Maybe they can afford something in terms of individuals' own realization, but they they they're participating in the the general breakdown. So that's my you know it's it's a tall it's it's I know that it's not it, it, it's a it's maybe idealistic, but that is that is at least the the road that I've I've kind of got got myself on. Well, the last thing that came up for me right there was uh, it's kind of a it is very much a double edged sword, and I think there's a way to actually to convert it from a sword into a plowshare. So if you were coming from the late 20th century, um, what's it called, secular humanist, scientific materialist lineage, and you would like the world to hang together, you have a very practical problem, which is that there's about 100 million of you, and there's about 7 billion people who are deeply committed to some lineage or tradition that it gave rise to where they are today. Um, and the likelihood that you are going to convert them en masse to your particular momentary piece of history is not going to happen. Zero. It's in fact zero. So something has to happen that actually is able to do what you're talking about, uh, to, to actually go the opposite direction instead of trying to, to browbeat the people who are holding these lineages into submission, <laughs> actually cast more light and shine more light. But then that's one, that's one edge because the other edge is we have to figure out how these guys are actually able to enter into a truly non-oppositional mindset. And we need to get our Protestants and our Catholics to for forever, like really forever, stop hacking at each other because of disagreements about um, things that I don't even understand. And, and, and then expand that out, right? Because the, the big embrace here is going to have to include, there's a, there's a billion Muslims, right? And they come with their own internal conflicts with each other. That's right. Um, in, permanent. Uh, and then I've got a whole lot of other folks with lots of different lineages of greater size and scope um, and antiquity. And all of us are going to have to be able to live together really, really well, like at a level of living together well, that has rarely been seen in a single household, much mm. less in the entire human family. Yeah. 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 That's it. You, you just made my hill a lot steeper there. <laughs> yeah. But and now you're on the right hill. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Is that the hill to die on, though? Mm. Um, yeah, maybe. No, and a beautiful image of a double edged sword being turned into a plowshare. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody somewhere probably thought of that first. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.